Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb, Yeshua our Messiah, on this your holy Shabbat. What an awesome thing it is to gather together as your people, Israel, natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah, Yeshua. Father, we just ask that you'd open the eyes of our understanding today, that you would enlighten us to the hope of your calling. Teach us your ways, Father. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In the name of Yeshua our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, Chai Sarah is Sarah's life, or the life of Sarah. And it is Genesis, Bereshit 23, 1 through 25, 18. About two and a half chapters. And we'll start reading it, 23, 1. It says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So our Torah portion is called Sarah's life, yet it begins with her death. We need to look deeper into what Sarah did with her life as she submitted to Yahweh. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 3.1. He says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So again, Abraham, father of our faith, Sarah is, was his wife, and the daughters who learn how Sarah operated are the daughters as well if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. It goes back to obedience again, doing good. We're going to be judged by our works when we stand before Him. It's not just saying the sinner's prayer and it's all right because His blood paid the price for your sins, past, present, and future. Although that is a reality, the thing that they don't understand about that is you have to abide in Him in order for His blood to be cleansing you. If you walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. It's conditional. And we abide in Him. We walk in the light through our obedience. So there's not only protection, but power in staying submitted to God-given authority, like Sarah demonstrated. Yahweh has given the power to a godly life, a wife, to win her ungodly husband. I'm getting warm. Are you guys? Are you good? Okay. I'm going to kick this off then, and if you get cold again, let me know. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now in 1 Corinthians 7 13 it says, And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if she's willing to live, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now are they holy. So Yahweh's given the power to a godly woman to sanctify an unbelieving husband as well as her children and to a, a godly man to sanctify his unbelieving wife as well. The power of one believer is more than anything that the darkness can do. It's all it takes is one person standing in faith can win, because love never fails, can win the unbelieving husband and can win the children. In Genesis 18:12, it says in our Torah portion, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So we see that Sarah did call her Lord. Actually, this was from last week's Torah portion. But it's that attitude of understanding that this is a partnership, but there has to be a head in every partnership. There has to be one that leads and one that follows. So Sarah received the blessing of a child in her old age as a result of being submitted to Yahweh by submitting to her husband. She understood being under authority as well. We talked about it last week. Being under, under authority is an important thing to realize. It's where we get our authority to walk in. 
and the blessings of the Father will flow through us as long as we're plugged in. So there's a great power and authority that comes through proper submission to God-given authority, like we said. Genesis 24, 1 says, By now Abraham was an old man, well on in years, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to the senior servant of his household, the steward of all his property, Place your hand under my thigh. I'm going to make you swear by Yahweh, God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to my native land and my own kinfolk to choose a wife for my son Isaac. Now, how many of you guys know that Yahweh will not join just any two people together? Yeshua says when they're asking him about divorce and remarriage, what Yahweh has joined together, let no man put asunder. But there's some relationships Yahweh will not join together because they go contrary to his word. So in young people looking for a spouse, these are some things that we need to understand that we don't settle. You can't settle because picking your spouse is the second most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. The first being to submit to Yeshua and making him Lord becoming a new creation, but then the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with as your partner. Now, Abraham understood that Yahweh's covenant people are not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. He would not let his servant take a wife for his son from the heathens that they were living amongst. So he sent him back to his own home country where they knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Deuteronomy 7.1 says, When Yahweh your God has brought you into the country which you're going to make your own, many nations will fall before you, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than yourselves. Yahweh your God will put them at your mercy, and you will conquer them. You must put them under the curse of destruction. You must not make any treaty with them or show them any pity. You must not intermarry with them, you must not give a daughter of yours to a son of theirs or take a daughter of theirs for a son of yours. For your son would be seduced from following me into serving other gods. The wrath of Yahweh would blaze out against you and he would instantly destroy you. Some powerful stuff on who we choose to be married to. It can bring a blessing or it can bring a curse. Now Yahweh is very specific about this danger. Exodus 34, 12 says, Take care that you make no pact with the inhabitants of the country which you're about to enter, or they will prove a snare in your community. You will tear down their altars, smash their cultic stones, and cut down their sacred poles. For you will worship no other god since Yahweh's name is the Jealous One. He is a jealous god. Make no pact with the inhabitants of the country, or when they prostitute themselves to their own gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will participate or partake in their sacrifice. And then you will choose wives for your sons from among their daughters. And their daughters, prostituting themselves to their own gods, will induce your sons to prostitute themselves to their gods. Bad company corrupts good morals, especially if you're married to one. This is a decision you do not want to, to have. So this is our second witness from the Torah. Now Paul also talks about it in 2 Corinthians 6.14. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? So even if somebody's claiming to be a Christian following Jesus, if they are lawless, like the one standing before him in Matthew 7, they are not qualified to be a spouse for a Torah observant believer either. Because you don't know if they will fall in love with this Torah or if the programming they grew up with, which is why we're supposed to train our, train our children when they're young. When we're programmed growing up, that's usually what we revert back to. So I've got a brother that married a woman that was not Torah observant to start with, but she says, yeah, I'll, I'll walk in Torah. They got married, and she went back to her Christianity and rejected the Torah. So... We have to make sure that we know that this person, it's best to get one that was raised in Torah because that's what they'll revert back to when push comes to shove, which is why we've got to really train our children up right. So what fellowship has righteousness, and that's one who is obedient, 
Because remember in, in Romans 6, it says, don't you know that whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, that's whose servant you are, whether or sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So those that are obedient, what do they have to do in fellowship with those that are lawless? Even if they claim to be moral. I mean, there's lots of moral people. Mormons make great neighbors. But they don't understand what it takes to make it and endure to the end. So just morality is, is not what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody that has a living relationship with the creator of the universe, that know him personally, intimately. What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Messiah with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, which means the body of those unbelievers, their bodies are temples for the devil. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Now, the flip side of that is true. If we decide to ignore his warnings and go and do what we feel like doing anyway and touch what is unclean, he will not receive us. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He wants an obedient people. He wants to be able to bless us, and that's what obedience is all about. It helps us to stay in that secret place of the Most High, plugged into the Messiah, so his blood will continually cleanse us of all sin. But we have to do our part. Now, Paul reveals that somebody that does not keep Yahweh's Torah would be in a category of a false religion. We're to separate from him and not touch what is unclean, and Yahweh will receive us. Now, there again, that doesn't mean that we can't fellowship with them to try to let our light shine and draw them to Torah, which is what we did at the conference the other day. But we're not supposed to go and fellowship with them to go to their Sunday church and participate in their false religious system. That's the distinction. See, the people are precious. If they're, especially if they're born again, they are children of the Most High. They're our brothers and sisters in Messiah. Doesn't mean they're going to make it to the end. So we need to be moved with love and compassion and try to draw them into what we know will, will help them hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now back to our Torah portion. In Genesis 24, 5, it says, The servant asked him, What if the girl does not want to follow me to this country? Should I then take your son back to the country from which you came? Abraham replied, on no account are you to take my son back there. Once Yahweh draws us out from our place that he's taken us from and moves us to another place, he doesn't want us going back. I mean, unless he tells us, but all the examples we have in Scripture, when he moved Abraham out, he didn't want him to go back. When we came out of Egypt, he didn't want us to go back. So when he takes us out of a place, he wants us to stay in the place that he's put us. He's the one that puts us in his body where he wants us. And he doesn't want us going back. Again, Abraham understands the importance of staying where Yahweh placed him and keeping Isaac there as well. Genesis 24, 7, it says, Yahweh, God of heaven and God of earth, who took me from my father's home and from the land of my kinsfolk, and who promised me on oath, I shall give this country to your descendants. He will now send his angel ahead of you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. So Abraham had inside information as he was a prophet as well as we learned from last week's portion in Genesis 20, verse 7. It says, Now son, uh, send the man's wife back, for he is a prophet and can intercede on your behalf for your life. But understand that if you do not send her back, this means death for you and all that is yours. So Abraham continues in Genesis 24, 8. If then the girl refuses to follow you, you will be quite quit of this oath to me. Only do not take my son back there. And the servant placed his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore to him that he would do it. The servant took ten of his master's camels, and carrying all kinds of gifts from his master, set out for the city of Nahor in Aram Naharim. In the evening, at the time when women come out to draw water, he made the camels kneel down, out, or kneel outside the town near the well. And he said, Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show faithful love to my master Abraham. While I stand by the spring, as the young women from the town come out to draw water, I shall say to one of the girls, please lower your pitcher and let me drink. 
And if she answers, drink, and I shall water your camels too. Let her be the one you have decreed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown faithful love to my master. So Abraham's servant Eleazar was being led by Yahweh's spirit as well. Putting out a fleece, as we would say. <clears throat> And here we see the answer in Genesis 24, 15. He had not finished speaking when out came Rebekah, Rivka, who was the daughter of Betuel, son of Milcha, the wife of Avraham's brother Nahor, with a pitcher on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful and a virgin. No man had touched her. She went down to the spring, filled her pitcher, and came up again. Running towards her, the servant said, Please, give me a sip of water from your pitcher. She replied, Drink, my lord and quickly lowered her pitcher on her arm and gave him a drink. When she had finished letting him drink, she said, I shall draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough. She quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran to the well again to draw and drew for all the camels. Ten camels can drink a lot of water. That wasn't just some passing little fancy thing. It probably took her over an hour to do that. <clears throat> he was looking for the, the character quality that would make a good wife as being a helper that had a heart to serve. <clears throat> All the while, verse 21, the man stood watching her, not daring to speak, wondering whether Yahweh had made his journey successful or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and put it through her nose and put two bracelets weighing ten gold shekels on her arm and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room at your father's house for us to spend the night? She replied, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son whom Milcha bore to Nahor. And she went on, We have plenty of straw and fodder and room to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshipped Yahweh, saying, Blessed be Yahweh, God of my master, Abraham, for not withholding his faithful love for my master. Yahweh has led me straight to the house of my master's brother. So Abraham, the prophet, gets a supernatural word about Yahweh's going to send his angel there. The servant goes down there expecting it to happen, and it happened right off the bat, just like he said. He knew that Yahweh was faithful. He knew that Yahweh is a supernatural God. The supernatural realm, we can't see it with our physical senses, but it's more real than this physical realm that we can see. Heaven and earth was going to pass away, but my words will not pass away, Yeshua said. And the, the spiritual realm is eternal. It overlaps our physical realm. It's all around us. There's angels here. There's demons here. We can't see them, but they're more real than everything we see because everything we see here is going to burn one day, but the spiritual will go on. We've got to keep our eyes on the reality. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But guess what? Yeshua has already defeated all of them. They're under our feet. It's up to us now to enforce their defeat. doesn't mean they're not going to try to rise up. We just stomp them back down again when they do, though, because they have no place in our life. So Yahweh was the one who led Eleazar to the house of his master's brother. We can see that some people in Scripture were led by Yahweh's spirit, but not everybody had this ability before his spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. It was only the prophets, basically, back then, or those that were servants of the prophets that could be led that way. Now, in the New Covenant, we're all supposed to be led by Yahweh's Spirit because, as we've studied, we are literally new creations. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If any man be in Messiah, and that being in Messiah is an action that we do through obedience. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we know that we're in him. So if any man be in Messiah, he is a new creation, a species that never existed before. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God now. So that's why generational curses and things like that we know is just the devil trying to put things on us and trying to get us to accept them because Scripture says all the old things have passed away. All things, have, we, we switch our citizenship. We switch our father. We don't have the same junky family line that we used to. We've got the creator of the universe as our daddy now. So in Romans 8, 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Every one of us now, when we're born again, we get His Spirit within us. Now, in order to be led by His Spirit, we have to do some things to be able to hear Him. 
If we want to understand Yahweh and His ways, we have to seek His Spirit to reveal it to us. In 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul tells us, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. It has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. So Yahweh rarely speaks spectacularly or in an audible voice. I've never heard an audible voice. It's always been like, I've never even really heard a voice even within. It's always just been like, all of a sudden he downloads information and I just know. I mean, that, that's kind of how it works with me. So, Could be, yep. And, uh, and things that come in our minds that we know didn't come from us, but we know line up with the scripture. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that he can, he can lead us. And he can do it with an audible voice if, if need be. In 1 Kings 19.11, we see him dealing with the prophet. Then he was told, go out and stand by the mountain before Yahweh. For at that moment, Yahweh was going by. A mighty wind split the mountains and shattered the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. Although fire is a representation of Yahweh sometimes. And after the fire, a light murmuring sound. And when Elijah heard this, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then a voice came to him which said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So we have to really be listening to hear Yahweh's voice. We have to take the time to be, be still, be quiet before him. And the best thing to do to, before that is to worship. He inhabits the praises of Israel. So we can worship him. We can get into his presence and then listen. In Luke eleven nine, 9, we're told, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For with everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? See, he wants to give us the Holy Spirit, but he also wants us to want it. We have to ask. We have to take that first step. We are the gods of this realm. If you remember, we have to do the initiation. Yahweh's right there to, to help us, to be there with us. But we have to be the ones to step out. We have to be asking and seeking to hear his voice. Now, in our apostolic writing portion of this week, Yeshua tells us about living water. This is from John chapter 4, starting at verse 4. It says, but he needed to go through Samaria. What Jew ever needed to go through Samaria? The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. He needed to go because he was under instructions of his father to go and spread the kingdom. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Yeshua, therefore, being wearied from his journey, because he was a man just like us. He's not walking around here as God in the flesh, even though that's what he was. He came here as a man in man's authority, and he got tired and had to sleep and eat just like we do. Wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would have been basically noon. The uh, first hour started like six in the morning. The sixth hour would have been 12. The ninth hour would have been three in the afternoon, so on and so forth. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans, unless they're on a mission from the Father. I'm going to turn the heat back on. <clears throat> do what? On the floor? What do you mean? I don't know. It'll, it'll come out and heat normally rises, but it'll fill the whole room pretty quick. So. 
All right. Yeshua answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than the father, our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Yeshua answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. He's talking about the water of the Spirit being born again. And he explained this in John 3.3 3 to Nicodemus. Yeshua answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is why Judaism will never get you there, even though you, you want, might walk in Torah and pray to the God of Abraham, stand at the wailing wall and cry out, Mashiach, come. you got to be born again. You can't just be asking for him to come. You've got to get to know him. And he has to come live inside of you. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man who would be born when he's old? See, they understood born again in Judaism, but it was certain stages in your life that, that was called the born again experience. When you were born, that was the first time you were born. As a male, on the eighth day, you were actually given your name. You were circumcised on the eighth day, brought into the covenant. That was a born again experience. When you got your bar mitzvah, that was another stage in life where you became Subject to the commandments, according to Judaism. That was a born-again experience. When you decided to join a yeshiva to become a rabbi, that was a born-again experience. When you graduated and actually got the smicha, got the oil poured on you, that was a born-again experience. Nicodemus had gone through all of these, but he was old now. There were no more born-again experiences in Judaism. He didn't, didn't quite know what Yeshua was talking about. So Yeshua answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that's what being born of the water is, is the bag of waters. He's comparing the two. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's not talking about water baptism, although that is part of the process, but he's talking about you got to be born of the flesh first, out of water, and then you can be born of the spirit. So you have to be born, obviously, to be in this realm, but in order to be in the kingdom, you have to be born again, born of the Spirit. So the born again experience is like a well of water rising up out of our souls, springing up out of our belly. But going on into chapter 7 of John, verse 37, it says, On the last day of the great, the great day of the feast, which was Sukkot, Yeshua uh, stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Or out of his belly, innermost being. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. So he was talking about this other experience that a well springing up is water for the person. A river is to go forth and bless the nations. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was to give us boldness to be his witnesses, to take his message to the world for blessing others. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he had received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. He gave his authority to us. He's seated up there as our advocate, making sure that that connection, the power, is there. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So these signs would follow new believers. 
that was the only qualification is that you believed and were baptized. So if you've done that, you can expect these signs to follow you as well. This is what we're supposed to do as believers. Now, Yeshua told his disciples in John 15 that we would be known as his disciples by our love for one another also. So love never fails. We've got to have both. Now, Luke 10, 17, this was 70 of the disciples that were not the 12 apostles. These were just 70 regular disciples that hung out with Yeshua. And he sent them out, commissioned them, and then they returned. Again, with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing the devil can do is going to hurt us. He might try. We have to enforce his defeat, but he's defeated. He has no authority. He has no means to hurt us. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So again, like I said, this was given to the seven disciples even before they're born again. He already gave us the ability to be his representatives. But now that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, he literally has come to dwell in us, he and the Father, by his Holy Spirit. So we are light years above even these 70, and the ability that resides within us. Now, there's seven keys that will help us to walk in this power. We've gone over it a couple of weeks ago at the evening service, but not everybody got to hear it. And plus, I want it to be online so everybody worldwide can hear it. The first thing to be able to walk in the power that Yeshua wants us to walk in is to have an inward desire for the things of God. And I didn't write the scripture down, but in Hebrews 11, it says that he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So having an inward desire but then diligently seeking him is the key. And we can see this played out in Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. This was a Gentile, an uncircumcised person, but yet he understood that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was there for the Gentiles as well a devout man, and one that feared God with all his household. So he had the same qualifications that Abraham did. Last week we saw that Abraham, Yahweh, set him aside and made him his man because he knew that he would command his household wisely. This man did the same thing. One who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. That is one of the keys that we're going to go through. This man was doing it. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. So prayers and alms. Alms would have to do with worship. Giving to those less fortunate. Talking about Isaiah 58, is this a fast that I've commissioned where you give your food to feed the poor? I mean, it's the things that, that he talks about there as well. The things that we're going to be judged by in Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. Thirsty and you gave me drink. So your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Shimon, whose surname is Kepha or Peter. He is lodging with Shimon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Now, why didn't the angel just give him the message of salvation? Because Yahweh's commissioned men to be his ambassadors here. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an, with an object uh, like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him, let down to the earth. In it 
were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, there are all manners of animals in this sheet being let down. There weren't just unclean animals. There were kosher ones, too. But in Judaism, if you weren't trained to be able to do the ritual slaughter of a shochet, is what they call them, then you couldn't kill the animal yourself. You had to be ritually trained to do it just right, according to Judaism. Not what the Torah says, but Peter was raised in Judaism. Just like it's unlawful for one who is a Jew to go into one who is a Gentile. As we're going to see, that's what he tells Cornelius. Again, that's not Torah, that's Judaism. So, obviously he's never eaten anything unclean because we're commanded not to in Torah. But what about the common thing? Why wouldn't he get up and kill one of the calves or whatever that was there? He was hungry, but he wasn't trained, and so his Judaism told him that he wasn't qualified to do it. But what does God say? And a voice spoke to him the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. The unclean is obvious. The word lays that out. But your religion, just because it tells you you have to be trained a certain way, if the Torah doesn't say that, that's junk. It is not common. You can rise, kill, and eat if Yahweh created it to be eaten. So Yahweh's having to deal with him on his religious training because religion is of the devil. Unless it's the religion that James is talking about where you feed the orphans and the widows. But religious systems that do not line up with Scripture, they're of Satan. They're designed to take, make people feel good on that broad path which leads to destruction. It's the opiate of the masses. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter was wondering within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Shimon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And notice that God had to give him a supernatural vision to convince him to do this, because his religion had already told him, You don't do it. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent from him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted it up, saying, Stand up! I myself also am a man. When we're out laying hands on people and they're getting healed, we always have to point them back to Yeshua. It is not us. It is him working through us. He gets all the glory. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Verse 28, Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. And there again, it's unlawful according to Judaism, not according to the Torah. We're supposed to feed the stranger who is in our midst because we were strangers in Egypt. We're supposed to love the stranger. But God has shown me, verse 28, that I should not call any man common or unclean. So here we see what the vision was really was about. I mean, it was dealing with Judaism, but the main thrust was men are not unclean. They're not uncommon. I mean, we're all created in the image and likeness of God. He loves every one of us. Yeshua came and died for each one of us. We are not common, and we are not unclean. We are valued so much that God gave His only begotten Son without a guarantee that anybody would accept Him. But he loved us that much. So we are not common or unclean. 
Verse 29, Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, For what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius, Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call Shimon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Shimon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've come, you've done well to come. Now therefore, we're all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preach, preaching peace through Yeshua Messiah, he is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed through all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. All. And now that job is passed on to us, his ambassadors. For God was with him. God is with us. He is inside of us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Do you remember how many people he actually appeared to? It was almost 500. But when it came time to tarry for the Holy Spirit, only 120 ended up making it to the upper room. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who has or, or was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that, through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as had come with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So, obviously there's no formula. He was told us in the Great Commission that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Well, these guys were saved and filled with the Spirit before water baptism. So there's not a formula. It's just a matter of walking out obedience however you can. So that's the first one, is having a desire to have a relationship with the Father. The second one is discipline, which is where the word disciple comes from, the same root. Discipline to read the word daily. We have to feed on the word. Yeshua said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How can you hear that and not have a love for his Torah? All the way from Genesis to Revelation, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In Proverbs 4.20, we're told, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. In order to do that, we have to be memorizing Scripture. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So we need to be memorizing the word. In Psalms 119.11, we're told, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hiding it in our hearts. Memorizing it. Now this includes meditating on the word daily as well. Josh 1, 1, 7, it says, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the Torah, which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So obedience to his instructions contained in his Torah is all about wanting to prosper us everywhere we go. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth. 
So we need to be speaking it. But you shall meditate in it day and night. That's part of meditation and speaking it, muttering it to yourself, hearing it with your own inner ear as your mouth speaks it. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So you will not be prosperous and have good success unless the Torah is part of your life. And that's what the guys in Matthew 7 that said, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name and cast out devils in your name and done mighty works? They're doing the Great Commission. But yet he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who are lawless. Because without the Torah, you will not have good success. He's going to have to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Psalms 1.1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Now, who are sinners? Are they the drunk reprobates on the corner and the street people and the people you run into in the bars and the whorehouse? Well, yeah, but they're also the ones that we're not to be unequally yoked with as well, that go to the churches on Sunday but reject his Torah because they're lawless. But his delight, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You want success? Meditate in his Torah day and night. Love his Torah. Be zealous for his Torah. Now it goes on. That was all I had time to make notes for here. Communing with Yahweh through prayers of petition, listening for replies, like we said, be quiet before the Lord, praising, he inhabits the praises of Israel, and practicing his presence. In Psalms 22, 3, it says, Yet you are holy, O thou who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Now the Gentiles will try to quote this and say, Oh, he inhabits the praises of his people. Well, he does, but specifically he said it's Israel. That's because if we're in Messiah, then we're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and we're part of it. But we have to understand Israel bound themselves to walk in obedience to his Torah. So it helps when we understand who we are to give us the faith to be able to walk in the instructions he wants us to walk in. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He won't let us down. Men will let us down. Even our own families will let us down. But he will never let us down. He is faithful. And he is somebody that we can count on no matter what. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. The fourth thing. To walking in this power is the fellowshipping with like-minded believers. Bad company corrupts good morals. We want to hang out with people that's going to encourage us to walk the way that he wants us to walk. Laying hands on the sick, seeing them recover, casting out devils. People like the Baptists that have a form of godliness but don't deny the power thereof, that's not who you want to spend the major amount of your time with. Doesn't mean you can't go share your light with them, but you want to spend the majority of your time with people that's going to encourage you, that maybe even at a higher level than you are to help bring you up seek out somebody that's going to challenge you like that and then hang out with them now another thing like we're told meditating in the Torah day and night speaking these things constantly confess who we are in Yeshua constantly confess what he's done for us he's defeated the enemy he's made us more than conquerors he himself conquered he says you're in the world and the world's going to hate you because it hated me, but don't be afraid. I've overcome the world. He's made us more than conquerors. Confess the things. If God be for me, who can be against me? I'm a joint heir with Yeshua, our Messiah. Just the scriptures, the promises that he's made, start making you a list. Confess them daily. Speak them over yourself. Speak them over your spouse. Speak them over your children. Confess with your mouth the words. Confess the Torah over your family. Constantly be confessing the word. And then the sixth one is praying in tongues, loudly, long, and with intensity. Now we know in Jude it says, brethren, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost. It builds us up when we pray in the Spirit. It, it's like plugging the plug into the wall socket. 
you're plugging into the power when you're doing that. And it's the same thing when we're singing to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So praying in tongues loudly, you can pray in a regular tone, like we're in the service here and you feel the Holy Spirit coming up and you want to pray in tongues. You don't want to do it loudly here unless you know there's going to be an interpretation. But if you're in your prayer closet and nobody else is around, do it loudly. Get bold with it. Because it helps when you're, when you're using volume to put some oomph behind it. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. So get some fervency in it. Know that what you're saying, you don't know what you're saying, but know that what you are saying is going to come about. It is, in, in Romans 8, it says that we don't always know what we need to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit inside of us will pray the perfect prayer of what needs to be done with groanings that can't be uttered and one translation adds an articulate speech. So it's, it's praying in other tongues. Sometimes it's just groanings. But it's the Holy Spirit praying the perfect will of God through us to accomplish that. And we know in 1 Corinthians 14 it talks about that he that prays with an unknown tongue edifies himself. It builds you up. It's, it's part of... Paul tells Timothy in one point, stir up the gift that's within you by the laying on of my hands. Well, the, the way to do that is by praying in the Spirit. Singing to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in our hearts to Yahweh. And then finally, the final thing is, we act on the Word. We don't just learn about the Word. We are doers of the Word and not hearers only. Because hearing, that just makes you accountable. It's not until we do it that we're going to be doing things that we're going to be rewarded for. He's going to judge us by our works, not by our intents. There's that old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's what we do that we're going to be judged by, though. He wants us to be his representatives. He didn't just sit on his rear in the fishing boat and let the guys fish all day and just eat and drink. And Let me get you the microphone, Julie. So, Actually, um, never mind because it's turned off back there. Go ahead. Life flowing out of me yeah. makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets those captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, and give to me that life abundantly that's awesome i was thinking about doing that for worship today but i didn't have it all printed out and i didn't have time so <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's like in these assemblies of god or whatever that's an old song that we used to sing i guess that's where i heard it i think so yeah yeah it wasn't an assembly of god that we heard it from but anyway yeah it was oh was it okay yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> Actually, I think it's in the key of C. I could probably play it on the guitar, so we'll, we'll end up doing that today. How's that? Yep. Yep. That's about it. So that river of life is in us, and it's not just to keep for ourselves. That's what the well springing up is all about. The river is to bless the people, go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Amen. Don't pick and choose. Go do it to everybody. That's what he said. Everybody. He died for everybody. He wants us to go to everybody. So... We're going to put that into practice here in the month of May. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just come before you right now by the precious blood of the Lamb again. What an awesome thing it is to be able to study your Torah, to learn your ways, your instructions that you've given us as our loving Father, to show us what is pleasing to you. Give your people a love for your Torah, Father. Give us a zeal for your Torah and for your Holy Spirit, for your Messiah, Yeshua. I thank you that you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, 
Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh p'nave lecha. V'hunecha. Yesa Yahweh p'nave lecha. Vayasim lecha. Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We are dismissed. We'll go next door and eat a meal together. <laughs>